say a little bit about the origins of MI, about your own involvement, and we, how, did, how did it get started? Yeah. It, not in any traditional way. There was no theory or anything that this was derived from. I, I went off on a sabbatical uh, to Norway and worked at an alcoholism treatment hospital there. And they brought me in actually to lecture, as, as Toronto did, on behavioral treatment of, of alcoholism. Um, but I went with these new findings we had, uh, looking at accurate empathy while doing behavior therapy, the behavioral uh, self-control training, with a huge effect. So there was this enormous therapist effect, and therapist empathy accounted for two-thirds of the variance in, uh, in client outcomes in behavior therapy. And even a year later, we're still driving a quarter of the variance in, in how many drinks per week the person's having. So the more empathic the therapist, the less the client is drinking a year later, which I mean, this is amazing and bigger than any between treatment differences that we were seeing at the time. So I had that puzzle with me. Um, and it, it, it just happened that the director of the clinic said, would you be willing to meet with the, our psychologists? Most of them are pretty young, just out of school and kind of green, and, uh, and they're treating patients and just have a discussion every couple weeks or so and see what comes of it. I said, sure, I'll do that. And, you know, bright young group of psychologists, it was fun. So I, I began teaching them both some behavioral approaches, but in particular laying the foundation of a person-centered approach, uh, which wasn't so familiar at the, at the time there. And they wanted me to demonstrate then, to show them how I did this. Um, and I was essentially doing what I had done in Milwaukee when I went there to, um, on an internship and got to work on an alcoholism unit there. Totally ignorant of alcoholism, so I put on my Carl Rogers hat and listened to patients and I enjoyed it and they enjoyed it and I decided to go into the addiction field around that. So I so, uh, began role-playing with them. They would, they would role-play a patient that they were seeing in English, thank goodness, and, and uh, I would do my best to say, well, this, you know, here's what I would do. And un unlike my American students, these, these folks would stop me. You know, they would interrupt me and say, now, what are you thinking right now? What, you know, what, what's going on in your head as you're doing this? Let's say you, you reflected something the client said there. There were lots of things the client said. How did you decide to reflect that particular thing? You asked a question, but why that question? You know? and, and they caused me to verbalize some decision rules that I wasn't even aware of using, but seemed to be consistent in, in what I was doing that had mostly to do with, with arranging the conversation so that the client would make the arguments for change. And I was avoiding being the person saying, you should do this, you need to do this, you have a problem you know, making the arguments for change myself. And we batted those ideas around in the discussion group. Uh, and, and after a few of those sessions, I uh, just kind of wrote down the ideas that we had and what, what this looked like in what Carl Rogers would have called a discussion paper. And I thought, well, first I'll send this around to our group here at the clinic. And they had a look at it and both said, yeah, basically this is what we're talking about. And then I sent it to some colleagues um, and gave it the name Motivational Interviewing um, because it's about motivation. And I, I liked the term interviewing in English because it's power neutral. Uh, you can be a, a, a famous person being interviewed by a college student, and in that case, the interviewee is in the, in the power seat. You can be a, an employer interviewing people for a job, and then the interviewer is in the power seat. But it, it's a conversation, and yet someone has a different role in it, and so that's why I liked interviewing. Uh, but I certainly didn't go to Norway with any concept of, of an approach like this. So do you think of it as only focused on addictions at those time, or you thought of it right then 
that this might have enormous implications for all kinds of problems. Oh, no, only alcohol, in fact. That was it. I mean, the original article is called uh, Motivational Interviewing with Problem Drinkers, you know. So, so I hadn't even thought about applications beyond alcohol at that point. Uh, and alcohol is mainly what I had been, been doing. But no, no thought at all of all the places that it's gone in the, in the meantime. For a while, that's what we were thinking about. I mean, everybody was thinking about it. it's. It's really a way to look at, avoid, deal with the alternative to twelve step and avoid. Yeah. It. And that was the initial. But now it's gone much broader. It has indeed. Way, way broader. Yeah. It's sort of a essential approach to dealing with people and understanding people mm -hmm. and, and problems and so on. And that's thanks in part to Steve Rolnick, um, whom I met by accident again on the next sabbatical in Australia. And uh, the, the 83 paper had been published, the only thing I'd really published on motivational interviewing. And this guy in the office next to me from South Africa, but working in the UK, but living in Australia, says, said, Miller, you're the guy who wrote that paper on motivational interviewing. And uh, I was surprised anybody had read it. You, yeah. uh, I read it. <laughs> you read it. I, I read 83. Thank, I read thank it. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And Steve had not only read it, he was teaching motivational interviewing wow. up and down the UK and said, this has really become a preferred treatment for addictions in the UK. I had no clue. Uh, and the demand was high. I mean, he was busy teaching MI. And he said, I don't even know if I'm doing it right. You know, you've got to write some more. Uh, so I said, well, show me what you do. And so we you know, interacted with each other and talked about it. And, what he was doing had exactly the same heart as, uh, uh, and approach as I was describing. And so I said, well, well let's write a book together. And, uh, so out of that came the 91 book. And Steve really took this into healthcare in a big way. I mean, it was, it was getting picked up here and there, but, but I think I, I credit Steve quite a lot with seeing the ways in which this could be used in, in healthcare. So do you see uh, motivational interviewing, you, we, you see it in other problem areas. Can you say a little bit more about what the other problem, how you see it applied across different problem areas, how it's been used and what the efficacy is around that? Well, you, you know, I think ambivalence is human nature, that, that when we're faced with a need to change or thought about change, Part of us wants to do it, or knows that it, you know, maybe we should, or it would help, or whatever. And part of us is pretty comfortable with the way we're doing things now, and and so both things are there. And the ambivalence is big in the addiction field, but in healthcare, for example, turns out you, if if you get diagnosed with diabetes, there's some lifestyle changes that you need to make in order to be healthy. Most people don't make them, and and kind of. They know they should, but they don't get around to it. So it's the same kind of dynamic, right? Then corrections began picking it up, particularly probation, where uh, people had been uh, arrested and often jailed for an offense. Um, and part of them knows that, yeah, I really ought to change this. And part of them, that's how they make their living or you know, whatever. So same dynamic there talking to families as a social worker, talking to families about change, ambivalence comes up all the time, you know. And, and the more you push for change, the more the, the client pushes back and, and talks about not changing and why they don't want to change and how it would be hard for them and what would be difficult about it. And that dynamic that we call the writing reflex now just cuts across all kinds of professions. You know, whether it's it's law or management or uh, education, you know. Do you see anything in disciplines, across disciplines, any differences in terms of which is more acceptable and more um, meaning, amenable to the approach? It just has taken root in so many professions, you know. And, and psychology, ironically, is one of the last to, to come around to looking at this in, in treating psychological problems. But I think it's more that within professions, this attracts a certain kind of person. Uh, somebody who listens, somebody who's patient. Uh, they just kind of, I, what I say is they recognize it. 
when, when exposed to motivational interviewing, it's not like, boy, I never thought of this before or anything like this. It's like, yeah, this is how I want to be with people, you know, and to some extent, they already are with people in that way. Um, so I, I think more within profession you get variance than between professions. Yeah. There are things that we need to be teaching to get closer to what you're saying. I mean, in, in to, we teach person-centered, we teach foundations, we teach people, but there's something about MI that's very different. Yes. And I think that may be something we should be looking at in social work itself. Uh -huh. uh, for example, this, the skill level of the way you integrate strategic reflective listening mm -hmm. or use of oars differentially or choosing the taking the jaws of what's the word you use a very very nicely term S snatching change of, talk from the yeah. jaws of ambivalence these yeah. are things that we probably need to talk more about in social work because they're very geared to what we do but it would take our practice maybe a little bit further along i think yeah yeah well it, it, i mean that's the evolution from a person-centered approach so it, a person-centered approach is familiar of you know uh, accurate empathy and unconditional positive regard and so forth and traditionally was thought of as non-directive. Now, even Rogers himself kind of left that term behind. Uh, but but this, this has a clear direction to it. It's you, when you know what change you're moving toward, then there are specific strategies for doing that that go beyond the person-centered approach that have to do, as you, as you say, with strategically right. reflecting certain things more than others, asking certain questions more than others, putting, emphasizing certain content in summaries uh, more than other content in it. Um, and good evidence that it does make a difference. And the concept of change talk and the psycholinguistic analyses that Paul Omrein did to help us know what client speech is particularly important that when we hear right. it, uh, so that we can attend to that, we can evoke that, we can strengthen that. Uh, and I think that that's a, a unique contribution of motivational interviewing. One of the things you you emphasize, and I know I've been a lot of MIs, is accurate empathy mm -hmm. as a basic skill. Fundamental. And, yeah, and so it probably doesn't matter what profession you have to have that. We haven't, and there are ways to measure that as well. We, yes. we talk about. Yes. So would you emphasize that as part of a training? Absolutely. Yeah. For, I'm here for for thirty years. I taught that as the first course in the, in the <laughs> clinical psychology curriculum that uh, I mean, here's a way to be with patients. I mean, how do you talk to people? And here's, here's a, a well-developed, well-established, evidence-based approach. And you're not going to hurt people with this by listening to yeah, them. I, I'll tell you this little side story. I'm doing MI training for NIH, and I was saying that they, what do you do if people don't meet those requirements? You know, because there are people working there was like a blank stare because I was training this staff. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's, in theory it's right, but to implement, implement it is, is, can be a problem, I guess, across disciplines. I mean, folks often think they're doing a person-centered approach. And, and when they listen to themselves on tape or, or a coach does or whatever, there's not a lot of it there. You know, it's, I mean, they knew it at one point. And these are the folks that come back to motivational interviewing also and say, you know, I, I knew this at one point in my life, and I used to be pretty good at this. I've gotten busy doing checklists and evidence-based something or other and have forgotten about it. So let me ask you a $64,000 question. Yeah. <laughs> can MI teach accurate empathy? Can you do it as an MI? Can MI, with all the skill building we have, can we teach it? Two professionals. Yeah, it, it's not MI teaching it, of course, but but can professionals learn? Well, I'm saying MI because I think there are certain skills and techniques that we do in terms of measuring, giving feedback, looking at reflections, actually coding these things. Mm. We've got a tremendous coding system there. Yeah, it's very. It isn't like everybody else. It is something special. You do have. We do have measuring techniques that actually can measure degree the number of yeah. reflections. But so did Rogers. I mean, wh one of Rogers' contributions uh, was to say, you know, we ought to be testing our beliefs about psychotherapy. 
we've got to be measuring what we're doing and listening to our sessions and recording them and analyzing them and saying, is what I think true really true? And had a, actually a rather good measure of accurate empathy, which is the one I used in that study I mentioned that predicted two thirds of the variance. I, I read the article. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, now I think, our, I think our measures now are more refined. Uh, we have a global measure that, that is highly related to that drugs and car measure. And then also the behavior counts that you talk about. So I, I think we're better at measuring this now, but the roots of that really are, are back there yeah. in Rogers. I, well, it's commendable to you. You always defer to Carl Rogers. <laughs> Rest in peace, you always do that really, which I think is really a, a tremendous asset of yours that you're always looking at the picture and don't, and able to share the contributions that MI has made by going back to Carl Rogers. Well, it's 80% of what we do, and we've added some things to it that clearly are helpful, that you, you get more behavior change, you get more gain by adding this to the person-centered approach. But the foundation of what we do is that, and it doesn't work without that. Do you see motivational effectively employed across beyond clinical context, organizational change, community development, policy change? You see any role am I beyond the clinical settings that we usually talk about? Well, potential, yes. I mean, I, I, it's often not effectively deployed even in clinical settings, and that's been one of the main problems uh, <laughs> of, of quality yes. control or, or establishing a, enough skill that you really can make a difference to your clients. So we're struggling with that one in, in clinical trials and, and in the clinical world. But is, is, is ambivalence an issue in other areas of life? And could this approach be applicable in management? Sure it could. In education, Steve's already working on a book on, on motivational living in schools. So it's something, it's about human nature, really. It's not a not So a you used to see this whether a student comes into our program where their policy or administration, they should really be, have some exposure to the change process that would, MI could be doing in an organization as well. I some think exposure. so, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I was teaching at the business school in Paris 15 years ago. They were, they were interested in this, in, in business and management. Uh, and so I think the ideas have legs, you know, and they, they, uh, they yes. cross fields. The change process, the ambivalence can be done across, say, working with administration mm -hmm. or working mm -hmm. community settings itself. I think you're absolutely right. I, I totally agree. I think we've had a number of students and organizations and they learn how to connect to people, how to engage with people, how to express empathy. As absolutely you say, the ambivalence process is so much part of human nature. Mm -hmm. You have a great deal of applications yeah. across. What do you see as some of the implementation issues you're facing MI today in terms of everyday practice, where settings are, are not doing that? And yeah. how would you, how, how do you see that issue? Well, part of it is our continuing ed education model that you go to a workshop and then you've got it, you know? And I bought into that model for a while until I evaluated my own training and, and found that although the people I had trained believed they had learned it and said they were doing it and it was so valuable to them and they were using it in their practice, when I listened to the practice tapes after training, there was very little evidence I had been there. You know? It just it didn't make much difference in what they actually did in practice. And, and looking back now with, with wisdom of hindsight, I'm not sure why I ever thought that, that going to a workshop would change complex behavior. You know? uh, we, we don't teach people to fly airplanes by sitting in a workshop, you know? uh, or to play a musical instrument by sitting in a workshop, or to play tennis by sitting in a workshop. Uh, and yet that's how we do continuing professional education. You know? so, so that's part of it. And the other thing is I think this is deceptively simple that you, if you watch someone do person-centered therapy, watch Rogers, you know, it's, it's, well, it's pretty easy, you know, until you try it, you know. Um, and, and so I, it, it clearly is possible to believe you're doing it when what you're doing has almost nothing to do with motivational interviewing. And so I think that's, that's an obstacle to continued learning as well. And what, what's involved in learning a complex skill is ongoing 
feedback and coaching and learning over time, not sitting in a workshop and, and getting it, at least not for something like motivational interviewing. Right. Say it's 2030, okay, and we're going to a, a Mint meeting. What is, what, is, what is MI like in 2030? Just foresee, what do, what do you see? I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> I have no idea. I have not foreseen most of the things that have happened with motivational interviewing. When we wrote the first edition, we had no clue what the second edition would be like. And when we wrote the second edition, we, we were clueless about how very different the third edition would be and how much would be learned in the meantime. Hundreds of clinical trials, Paul Omrine's uh, yeah. psycholinguistic uh, research. Um, and so I don't know. I mean, I, I feel good about it. Uh, Steve and I have really backed away from uh, trying to govern or control or you know, do anything about this and turned it over to the next generation. And they're doing a great job with it. And it's just, I, I just feel like I'm riding a wave or kind of sitting in the bleachers, uh, <laughs> cheering and having fun, you know. Uh, but I don't, I don't know what changes will happen over that time. I mean, I, I would anticipate that this, it, it will spread into more areas of application. I would hope that we get better at uh, helping people learn it and, and you know, develop real skillfulness in it and not just do these one-shot workshop things. Um, and, and we'll know more about how this works and why it works and what, what actually goes on in a conversation about change that influences whether change happens or not. Right. Which is exactly what Rogers was doing too. I mean, I, I, I love the continuity of that. Um, but what will be the new wrinkles? I don't know. Do you think that people are asking the right questions now? We're asking better questions. Certainly, yeah. Does this work uh, is, is actually a pretty crude question, you know. Uh, I counted last month 470 controlled trials of motivational interviewing. And, and the question, does it work, is such a simple, simplistic question, you know. Uh, I mean, on the whole, yeah, there's a significant effect of it. High variability across studies across sites within a multi-site trial, among therapists within a single setting or trial, you know, that the variability is, is at the delivery level you know, uh, and not so much, it's not like a pill that you can give somebody that you know what's in it. Um, it, it really is a complex process that's learnable, documentable, measurable, codable, and all of those things. But I think we're not used to training at that level of complexity, whether it's behavior therapy or, you know, any, any approach. I think we know more about how to help people learn motivational interviewing than we have a research base for training in any other psychotherapy. I agree. So is there anything I should have asked you, I haven't asked you, that you think we should know and that you want to say something that might be relevant here? There's so much I'm curious about. I mean, I would, I, I think that learning motivational interviewing changes you. And, and I would love to know more about that. What, what's the effect, n not just on- Has it changed you? Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, I, I was not always a good listener, for example. Um, and and I, I mean, I feel like the practice of this and asking the questions and looking for answers and thinking about language and all of this has, has really changed who I am as a, or at least how I am as a, as a person. And I, I, I'm curious about that. Of what, what effect does this have on the person who's learning it? Because I, people tell me all the time, this changed my life. You know, I'm a, I, we heard it today. Wait, I, I, every workshop I hear it. I, 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 people just get, it happens all the time. It's, it's a, we keep saying the aha response, but we're getting mm. it, aha. Uh-huh, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, but what is that? I don't think we understand it no. well. We have anecdotes. And then I have the same question at a system level also. As you begin implementing motivational living in a system, how does it change the system? What's, what's the effect on us on service delivery, uh, on, the, on the way in which clients are treated within the system as you begin to get more people 
who are learning this and, and committed to providing it. So that's kind of the same question up one level, you know. Um, so I'm curious about that. And we, do, we don't have answers at this point for those things, but I'd love to know. Thank you so much.